unfortunately, the production of PVC releases toxins. So dioxin being one of them. Um, and this, by the way, PVC is everywhere. Just so, just so everyone's clear, like we are using it in our, our application and it is used all over the place. Hello, and welcome back to the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Meg Carney, and I'm an outdoor and environmental writer and author of the book, Outdoor Minimalist, Wasteless Hiking, Camping, and Backpacking. The Outdoor Minimalist Podcast has the goal to give listeners actionable ways to waste less hiking, camping, backpacking, and more during every step of their process. Your impact outdoors starts long before you hit the trail and goes beyond leave no trace ethics. You'll learn how to identify sustainable outdoor brands, how to ask hard questions regarding sustainability, and begin to shift and evolve your mindset to integrate minimalism into all of your outdoor pursuits. Unfortunately, we use a lot of toxic materials in the outdoor industry, and we have for some time. This reliance on synthetic and sometimes harmful materials has seen some major shifts due to regulations, but there are always some brands at the forefront of these big changes before they're forced to do so. One change that we have been seeing specifically in the water sports industry is the phase out or move away from the use of PVC materials. That's why in episode 156 of the Outdoor Minimalist podcast, we explore what PVC is and why it has been a popular choice for inflatable paddle boards, but also the environmental concerns associated with its production and use. To help break down these talking points and share a behind the scenes look at what it takes for a brand to make these types of material changes, I sat down to chat with Jimmy Blakeney. Jimmy has stayed true to his passion for board sports and paddle sports for his entire life. Even when it meant living in a van down by the river and budgeting only $10 a day for food just to spend more time on a board or in a boat. His stubbornness led to a full-time sponsored athlete status for 10 years and a U.S. national championship title, interspersed with gigs in every facet of the business side of things, from marketing and branding to product design, sales, logistics, customer service, and more. He's currently president and product designer at Isle, where he tries to balance his brain's inability to stop focusing on new product ideas and customers' needs with running one of the industry's top brands. Thank you for joining me on the Outdoor Minimalist podcast today, Jimmy. I'm excited that we could reconnect in this way, and I will have a start with my classic introductory question, which is how did you get interested in outdoor recreation and how does it fit into your life now? Yeah. So yeah, thanks. I'm really excited to be here. And um, yeah, the outdoors has definitely been something that's been a part of my life for since as long as I can remember. And the reason I got into the outdoors was really because of my, my dad and I would travel around with him hunting and fishing. I basically just was absorbed into his world of, you know, hunting and fishing, going fly fishing, going bird hunting. Um, so that just was a part of my life since I was a little kid. Um, as I got older, I, I, um, kind of, you know, as you do with your parents, sometimes like I, I, I kind of moved away from that part of the outdoor world into more sports. And so I got involved in, um, in water sports, which was born from really me being involved in skateboarding and snowboarding, which just kind of led to this natural affinity for, you know, being outside and doing something really active. But then I wanted to do it in a place like these rivers that I'd grown up around my whole life. So I was able to kind of take this more active lifestyle, sports oriented lifestyle and blend it with kind of that, you know, outdoor environment of, you know, being around a river. Um, so that's really how I got started. And that's been my, you know, I've been really fortunate to blend my passion with my profession pretty much my entire life. Yeah. And now you are working with Isle, the paddleboard and surf company. And so how did that kind of come into play? When did you transition into working in that arena? And for listeners that don't know what it is, do you mind explaining what the company is as well? Sure. Yeah. So I've been with Isle for three years and Isle is a brand that I always admired. I'm um, actually uh, knew, knew the founder. Um, he actually recruited me into this role, but uh, 
it is a brand that's been around for 20 years based out of San Diego. Um, you know, really our mission, if I just like, you know, the boilerplate mission we have is to inspire and equip for a life that's better and balanced through adventure on the water. So better and balanced is our tagline. You'll see that on a lot of our products. And we think of that as better and balanced as individuals, as communities, and also for the planet. So that's kind of how we think of balance. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's aisle. Um, Really cool brand. I'm really, really proud to be a part of it and to contribute to its, you know, 20 year history. And what's your role with them now? So I started three years ago as the v VP of product. I came on and developed a lot of our products. I'm a product designer at heart, but I've been involved in all aspects of the business. Um, for about six months, I was in the role of president while TJ, who was our, our president while I was there the rest of the time, moved over to one of the other brands in our group of brands with solo brands. That's a whole other story. Um, so I moved in the role of president, was managing our PL, um, and that was a great experience. But now, actually, I am now the chief product officer. It's just a big term for saying I am, you know, handling everything to do with our product development and our um our processes for production, as well as customer service and a few other things that are related. But um yeah, now Oru and Isle Oru has been a sister brand of ours under the solo brands portfolio for, for this whole time, for three years that, since the, um, the merger of all these brands came about, but now we're officially merging the two water sports brands. So now my responsibility extends to product development for both brands. Um, and so it's kind of an expanded role, um, more responsibility, um, more fun. That's a good way to look at it. And that's why you're kind of perfect for this topic. We talk a lot about materials on the podcast, as many listeners will know. And so today we're going to talk about PVC, which of course is a riveting topic, at least <laughs> maybe not to everyone, but I think that it's an important one to be having, especially in the water sports realm. Um, and so to jump right in, do you mind explaining what exactly PVC is and how it has commonly been used in water sports before? Sure. <clears throat> Let me qualify that I am not a chemist and um, my, my area of expertise is in the application of this material and use within our different products. So I apologize to anyone that's more technical than me that I might get something a little bit incorrect technically, but you know, PVC is polyvinyl chloride, and it is a material that is, it's very, very durable. Um, it's a great material because it's affordable to make. Um, it's easy to make. And for our purposes, where we're making inflatables in particular, because we specialize in inflatable paddleboards, kayaks, um, and other accessories, um, it makes an incredibly strong and airtight membrane that you can put on the inflatable to keep it protected, um, airtight, and long lasting. So those are some of the things about PVC that are great. Um, unfortunately, the production of PVC releases toxins. So dioxin being one of them. Um, and this, by the way, PVC is everywhere. Just so, just so everyone's clear, like we are using it in our, our application and it is used all over the place. Um, there are differences in the type of PVC you're using, though, because that has to do with the the phthalates that are used inside the um, the PVC. Phthalates are plasticizers that are typically used to make the PVC more flexible, more pliable, more rigid, whatever it might be. They're 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 giving it different properties, but those phthalates are one of the things that that are really potentially harmful. And so we we use. Um, Phthalate, as much phthalate three, phthalate three, that word is so hard to say, but as much, as little of it as we can is the simplest way to say it. However, you have to be careful because when you take that out, sometimes you can compromise the performance of the material. And so, of course, for us, when we're making an inflatable and it needs to perform and it needs to stay durable and not fail, we can't compromise the integrity of the product. So we're always balancing that and doing everything we can to minimize use of phthalates, except where it might be necessary to ensure the product doesn't get brittle and crack and pop, for example. Yeah, that's interesting always to hear about 
that balance and how you actually can integrate things and where it maybe wouldn't be as feasible. But from my understanding, Isle is working on phasing out the use of PVC materials. So what influenced that decision? Yeah, we definitely are. And, you know, I, since I've been involved with Isle, it, it's been something that's been on my radar. And I set us on a course uh, when I came into the company to uh, try to achieve being PVC free um, at at some point. And, and it has been a journey that we are on and we are still on it. Um, I would have loved for it to happen faster than it already has, but there's some realities, which I'll, I'll talk about that just make it a little bit challenging to, to move away from PVC as the go-to material that we put on as the membrane of these um, inflatables. So, um, you know, we we joined one percent for the planet uh, in 2024. So that's one thing that I'm just letting your audience know that like we've been on this journey because I believe like the journey towards sustainability. It's going to always be a journey. There is no perfect destination, but we're all on this journey of trying to do better. And we joined one percent for the planet because we wanted to really um, establish the fact that we are committed um, not only to supporting these causes, but also it helps us to highlight the fact that we're taking these initiatives like this one with uh, with trying to eliminate PVC. So um, yeah, that's kind of the impetus for why we've we started to look at alternatives and happy to talk about what those alternatives are as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely interested about the alternatives and how they compare, but I think before we get to that, I am also wanting to hear a little bit about how the transition has even like worked or like played out and what challenges maybe you faced in moving away from PVC and yeah, just that general trajectory. For sure. So I would say that the, one of the biggest challenges in moving away from something like PVC in a manufacturing process has to do with what I would call inertia, which is just the sheer weight of of uh, the fact that PVC is so embedded in production processes and there's this supply chain for it. There's a lot of people producing it. It's a widely used material. So whenever that happens, there's just this inertia of like continuing to use something. So if you think of that as a current in a river and now all of a sudden you're trying to swim against that current to get somewhere, you're really having to do that extra work to, to achieve that just because you're asking people sometimes to do things that is like not part of their normal flow, right? So like if we're working with a supplier or a material, either a material supplier or a fabricator and asking them to do something new, that's going to be, you know, a little bit extra work for them. And so we're asking them to come along on that journey. So that, that always creates, you know, a little bit of challenge. Um, but we've been able to, to successfully, you know, build out some, testing and pilot programs that have allowed us to really understand the alternatives um, of which there's one in particular that we're using to, to ensure that what we're doing is not only better for the environment, that is also going to be a product that's going to be safe and reliable to use. Um, so those are, those are equally important. I would say when we're, when we're dealing with, with these water sports equipment. I yeah, guess. and you mentioned the one alternative. So are you looking at like one specific material or have you tested a couple of different ones? What have you kind of landed on as the material you want to use moving forward? Yeah, so well, with regards to it, it's really PVC and then various versions of PVC. Um, and again, removing the phthalates wherever you can. So that in and of itself is is an effort. Then when it comes to alternatives, really uh, TPU is the the best alternative. And it's really one of the few alternatives that's that's something that actually can be put into the manufacturing process and can work. So TPU is thermoplastic polyurethane. And TPU is a great material because it is it takes less energy to make it. It's not toxic. It doesn't smell. Um, it does not have any any phthalates in it, so it is much cleaner for the environment. It's recyclable, so there's a lot of benefits to TPU. But you know, the fact that those characteristics are there for that material doesn't mean we can just 
switch over. We'd be great if we could because there are because of the chemical characteristics of TPU versus PVC. It affects how you're then then assembling the product and ensuring that the way you're using it is going to result in a product that's going to be long lasting, durable, and again not fail. That's really one of the key things. And and you know it, there's a lot of benefits to TPU. One of them is it is very durable, very flexible. So it's great for inflatables where we're rolling them up and then inflating them and rolling them back up. And it, it's really great for that purpose. Um, but it's also a little bit more flexible. And so that can create some challenges when you have a material that's a little stretchier. Um, so that can lead to some challenges that we, we've been working on how to overcome. And we've we found some really cool ways to do that. And we've actually launched the first, P, we're calling it PVC free, but it's a, it's a TPU based um, material. Um, and we've launched our first pilot program of that with our switch compact model for 2024. Oh, that's really cool. And with this merger with Oru, are you kind of implementing some of the same material changes or are the materials completely different? Because that's not an inflatable, that's like a foldable craft. Um, yeah, it do you is. mind explaining yeah, it's, that? It's, so we use polypropylene sheets for uh, for Oru and they're sheets that are extruded that the, you end up, you score, you essentially score them with heat and then you fold them up and to make them origami. They're really, really cool. And uh, I am not yet at a point where I would call myself an expert on these because we are brand new into this being a, a merged uh, division. So I am certainly very excited to be diving into Oru and understanding where we are today and where we're going to be going for the future. Um, but, you know, like the past three years has been really dedicated to focusing on this inflatable opportunity for us to, you know, make a, make a difference. Yeah, and I mean, you are releasing the switch or the pilot program with switch to be the TPU based materials. And so do you plan on implementing that across all of your aisle products or what is like the general trajectory to make them a more sustainable or less toxic material? Yeah, I mean, th that that is certainly uh, our long term objective. If we can get to the point that we can safely and effectively move away from PVC as the material uh, of choice, then we'll, we will certainly continue to do that. Um, you know, again, we have to overcome factors that are not only including the manufacturing and fabrication, um, but also cost. So this is not a cheap material. So for those of you that may have seen, or if you're on our website and you, and you go look at the switch compact, it's our cool new little foldable, uh, really, really small compact um, paddleboard kayak hybrid. Um, and so that board we have in limited quantities in the PVC free TPU construction. It's about 95% PVC free because we still have to use some PVC for some of the sections where we're creating critical bonds where we can't afford to have failures. Um, and so those are the ones where this is for production, but, you know, I'm actually, I'm, I'm here in Rhode Island. This is the world headquarters for aisle R and D. So I have a shed out back and I have prototypes that are in various stages of, uh, testing and, uh, abusing to ensure, you know, they are, they're well, well tested and we are confirming, you know, how they do in the sun, how they do in the heat, how they do in the cold, how they do through multiple folding and rolling and creasing and crimping and piercing or whatever we're doing to them to beat them up. Um, so all that is, is, has been in process and it continues to be in process. Uh, so as we look ahead, this pilot program program that we have now with this limited, limited quantity that's available will help us just roll that out. Um, and we communicate with our customers. So if somebody has one of these boards, we'll be communicating with them and, and just understanding their experience with it as well, because that just gives us a bigger sample size for, for you know, people that are using the product. Um, so, you know, we're just trying to crawl before we walk and, and make sure we don't create a different problem, um, you know, that we're not aware of. And that's always a challenge when you're doing R&D and development and coming up with something new is, uh, you know, the unknowns that you're, that you're not thinking of that might impact uh, something in a, in a way that you're not not anticipating and not, not wanting. 
Yeah, but I think that is important to communicate, I guess, to customers or listeners, because sometimes I think from the outside looking in, people will be like, well, what took them so long? Or why is this transition happening so slow? But there are so many moving parts and you want to make sure that your product is still durable and works as effectively, if not better than it did before. So it's good to see the behind the scenes and like how that process actually unfolds. Adventuring plans on your calendar? Remember to grab your Lava Linens travel towel on your way out the door. Founded by a mother-daughter team, Lava Linens crafts durable, luxurious travel towels as a more sustainable and better performing alternative to microfiber and cotton towels. Powered by flax, hemp, and tensile, they're designed to be by your side for years to come. Use the code OUTDOORMINIMALIST for 15% off your next order. I guess, are there other aisle materials within the paddle boards that you're looking at critically and that you're considering besides PVC? Yes. I mean, we're TPU is a material we can use in our bags as well. Um, TPU is a material that can replace PVC for linings. Um, you know, there's a lot of different uses where you can, you can use TPU. So we are looking at that and we are currently using it for some of these, for example, in our bags, we're using a, TP, a TPU liner instead of a PVC liner. Um, that's just one example. You can create a waterproof membrane that's thinner for like, let's say a waterproof bag. Um, you can use TPU for that instead of PVC. Uh, there are foams. Um, so we do use a lot of EVA. Um, ethyl vinyl acetate is what EVA is. It's what a yoga mat is made out of. And you've probably seen some yoga mats that have like a more eco-friendly EVA material. And we are, we are using some of that as well. There's, um, there's some different algae foams available. And so we test all those materials as well. Um, and we've been using some of the algae foam, but the challenge there is that it's, uh, the color, the colors are different. So when it comes to color, one of the things about aisle is we are, you know, we have a really cool, um, color palette, and the colors that we have, we want to obviously keep, and our customers love the colors that we bring the products to life with. And so, you know, finding a way that you can still maintain the same colors using this this uh, algae foam is is a bit of a challenge, but it's something we're working through. So that's another material we're using. Um, and in general, our packaging is another area where we've really made a lot of progress. We're using way way more um, paper packaging wherever we can, because it can be recycled. Um, fewer poly bags, just polyethylene, just, just little bags. We still use them. In some cases, you just have to use them because you need to keep the items together. But for example, we have a, um, a repair kit and it actually now looks like this. It's just a little, a little bag that's sealed at the top. Um, and this used to be a big plastic canister that was like this orange canister. And this is a good example of like inertia. Those orange canisters, they were just ubiquitous. Everybody was using these canisters as, and all that was inside them was a little wrench for your valve, for tightening your valve, and a few little patches of PVC, actually, to for a repair patch. Well, that all fits in this little bag way easier, and this is a lot smaller and thinner and recyclable. So we moved over to that for, for our packaging there. Um, so, so that's something where we definitely feel like there's a lot of opportunity to. Do you think the discussion around PVC could be broader in the outdoor industry? And like, would you like to see more companies kind of taking the path that Isle has been to move away from it at all? Well, I know some other companies have, uh, I know, you know, I think, just like with all of us as individuals, we're on our own journeys. Every brand is on its own journey. And I certainly respect any other brands, you know, efforts and decisions around that related to their own products. I know one that I have a lot of respect for uh, and a friend of mine is uh, Philip Curry at uh, Astral. And Astral has done a lot. They did a lot with the foam in life jackets. And this is back a long time ago. And they were able to... Um, really improve the manufacturing of that foam, making it a lot less toxic. So I think that as a whole, as an industry, it would be nice to have 
you know, a little bit more cohesive um, effort as an industry. I think that is something that certainly we could probably do better as an industry. But I think at the same time, like I said, everyone's kind of on their own journey. They have their own challenges as a business, just trying to trying to, you know, make ends meet and and be profitable at the end of the day so they can stay in business. So I respect all those challenges and I applaud all the all the brands that don't just think about that bottom line, but they think about, you know, the environmental bottom line as well. Because um, you know, we we certainly feel that that is that is something critical that we support and that we push towards. And it's just part of our, it's part of our DNA as a brand. That's great. If you've enjoyed listening to this interview and any of our other interviews on the Outdoor Minimals podcast, we'd love to hear from you. One super easy and free way to support our content is by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. We thank you for listening to and supporting our work so that together we can create a better outdoor space as we recreate. That's most of the questions that I had for you. So are there anything, any other things that you feel like we missed or that you wanted to add? Mm, well, I guess I would just say that, you know, I, I would, I would say that being outdoors and living an active lifestyle and getting more people involved in the outdoors is paramount to, you know, raising awareness, not only just awareness, like awareness that you would like see on your phone, but awareness, like actually in your being of the environment and how important it is, because like I have two kids and they're not as involved in being outdoors the way I, I was as a kid. Um, and so I'm finding ways to keep them connected and keep them, you know, being a part of the natural world in a way that makes them respect it, understand it and want to protect it. So I just think that's critical for all of us. Um, and the other thing I would say is that like for Isle as a brand, the way one of the ways we think of isle is that you know isle as a word it means a little island and uh the cool thing is that's like a metaphor right it's a metaphor your paddleboard or your kayak that's your isle that's your own little isle on the water and then the way we also think about that and the way we frame up you know our efforts for you know protecting the environment and trying to create more sustainable products is that we're all on earth and Earth is an isle. It's a tiny little isle in the universe, right? So that's like the extended metaphor for the isle brand that we think about. And um, it just helps keep us grounded to the fact that we're all on this tiny little isle floating in the universe and we need to protect it. I love that. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book, on YouTube, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.